Praise the Lord. God bless you. Thank you for coming out on a Wednesday night. Amen. Let's, let's stand. Just pray that God would, uh, would bless us with his presence tonight. I know there's other needs in this place. Just lift up your hand. He knows every situation and every circumstance. Lord Jesus, we love you and praise you and pray, God, that you would, you would have your way in this place tonight. Let your spirit rest upon this congregation. Fill this house with your glory, Lord. Speak your word, Lord God, to our hearts. Change souls, Lord God, tonight. Change hearts, Jesus, and minds by the power of your spirit. I pray that you would have your way. Minister to those that, that have a healing need, to those that have a financial need, to every need that's in this place, God. I pray that you would stretch forth your hand and, and change the situation, change that circumstance, God. Let your perfect will be done. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you for your goodness and mercy. Thank you for all of your blessings and have your way in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. God bless you again. Um, we are going to be blessed tonight. Brother and Sister Calhoun, missionaries to the Netherlands, are going to be here ministering to us tonight. And with that, I'm going to give you the floor. Brother Calhoun, come. Have, have, just give us whatever God has given you tonight and just take your time. Thank you. There we go. Yeah, well, thank you for, uh, for uh, allowing us to come. Thank you, Pastor and Sister Moody, for, for blessing us, for feeding us. And also, the Moody's have personally been our partner the, for the, since we became missionaries to ne the Netherlands. So how many's heard of Holland? Well, Holland in the Netherlands means exactly the same thing. Amen. So why we need two names is because it's such an incredible country. Amen. God is so good. We love you guys, and uh, we're going to play a video for you right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, bro. It's not really about the beautiful wooden clogs or the Delft porcelain. It's, it's not even about the beautiful sheep farms or the 1,095 still operating windmills, some of them over 400 years old. Beautiful old city like Dordrecht. 800 years ago had city status, but it's not even about the architecture. We left our, our two adult children and our parents, family, and friends in Canada. And in December 12th of 2017, we arrived. We had sold all of our stuff or given it away. And so with just eight suitcases after 30 years of marriage, uh, we arrived here in the Netherlands. We created five new websites in Dutch and English that's reaching so many people in our cities. And then live stream, taking our game up because of the pandemic, of course. Vatani, originally from Hong Kong, was filled with the Holy Ghost while she was watching an online service. The first time we met her is when she came to the church facility to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So God called us here to reach people, disciple people, and of course, to empower them. And I am so very blessed to lead the education and mentoring uh, part of the Netherlands in our national work. We started with one campus and then expanded it to two campuses. And we have four times more students attending than we did when we first came. This is exciting because Bible school students, MITs, that's ministers in training, are empowered, being empowered, being trained, and they are teaching Bible studies, they are reaching into new communities, and this is what the Kingdom of God is all about. Carla is our national ladies leader. She's a fabulous teacher, but she excels in mentoring people, especially young people, for the Kingdom of God. We totally renovated this building. New signage, uh, new decor, 200 brand new chairs, a new roof, new offices and of course an Elevate youth room and Sunday school as well. But it's not really about the Calhouns, it's about Jesus, it's about the team, it's about an incredible group of people that are passionate about moving the kingdom forward in the Netherlands. It's about expansion 
It's about revival. It's about harvest. We uh, translated, had the, the, the newest Exploring God's Word uh, home Bible study translated into Dutch. And so many people are teaching this in so many different uh, cities, towns, and villages to family members, to loved ones, to small groups. Here we are in the middle of this incredible city. We are planning a church with MITs, that's ministers and trainees and, and, young, and young people. We're planning a church in the heart of the Hague. It's about the 17.5 million people in this people congested nation, this little nation with so many people, with so many cultures, with so many needs. And God is going to pour His Spirit out and is pouring His Spirit out in such an incredible way right now, right here. I know it's a crazy, crazy world and Jesus is coming. Help us, help us reach people in this incredible nation before he comes back.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. You can, let's stand together. Please pray for us. We do have, amen, because of our immigration to the Netherlands, we have a very short few months that we need God to bless us and so we can get back on track. Please come by our table, and uh, we've got some great things to sell to you that will be a benefit, but also if someone would like to be our partner in missions, we would so appreciate that. Um, for as little as $25 a month that really, really helps us big time in Jesus' name. But I really feel like we need to go right to God's Word tonight. Amen? So we're going to go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. And while you're turning there, I want to say how much I love this building Uh, and uh, the quality and everything from the plants to the musical instruments, everything is just done so well, and uh, just everything looks so sharp, and when we came in, I was just just so impressed, and I like 99, I think that was the first time we went to that restaurant, <laughs> uh, so we're Canadians, eh, right, we're Canadians, living and missionaries to the Netherlands, amen, so uh, we're, this is just who we are, so we're going to read the Bible. And uh, you got it in the King James. I'm going to read it in a, in a simple translation called the NLT. But you'll see it on the screen in the KJV. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. And this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. This old life is gone and a new life has begun. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. And so the title, are you ready for the title? It's a tell, T-E-L, or a transformation. Amen. And uh, one more time, let's pray and really reach for the Lord together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We magnify you. We worship you. We lift you up, Father, in Jesus' name. God, I pray in Jesus' name that your power, Lord, that your anointing, that your spirit would break every yoke, that by the power of the name of Jesus, that lives would be transformed today, that, Lord God, people would be touched today, Jesus Minister, God, by the Word of God. Minister by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Strengthen us, I pray, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. You can be seated if you like. Amen. A tell. Does anyone know what a tell, T-E-L, is? I didn't until I did a little bit of research, and I found out that a tell is a Hebrew word. And it literally just means, in the origin, it means a mound. So think of like a little hill. And then this here platform for tonight will be our hypothetical tell. Hey, guys, good to see you. This, is, this will be a tell. But it's not just a mound. It's a particular kind of mound. It's a mound the archaeological people, smart people, have dug into and found things. And uh, in the Middle East especially, you'll find all kinds of tells. How many ever heard of Tel Aviv, right? Or Tel Megiddo? You know, there's tells, and the reason why they're tells is because there's this particular kind of mound. So, basically, uh, a tell is this. I even have a proper definition it's a creation of hum- by human occupation and abandonment in a geographical site over many, many centuries. In other words, I want you to think about it this way. It's a mound with layers and layers and layers of history. Okay, so imagine that we're a tribe, you know, and we build a, a town 
And then, uh, you know, a pestilence comes by and wipes uh, most out and the rest leave. And so it becomes a ghost town. And then the, the mud huts and the, all disintegrate into the ground. But now it's higher. And then some people come back, like the site, and build another generation later or two or three or maybe a hundred years later. Build on exactly the same site. And then it happens again, maybe a war or something happens or a drought, a famine. And then that community is gone and another one sometime in the future comes back. And they said that often they will use the, you know, the broken remains of the former civilization to build the new civilization so imagine, again, this platform is a tell, and you're building your town, your life, your village, your school, your work, your family, and you're building it upon past things, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. And you're actually using <clears throat> the things under you as building blocks for the next level. And uh, this happens Again and again, and the people find their way back somehow to that beautiful place, that same place, the same location. Sometimes the tell gets to be so high uh, that it becomes very, very, uh, you know, prime real estate. Location, 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 right? And so people want to build on it because if you're high up on the site now, you can see the enemy if he comes uh, from far away. And so think of a tell as living upon layers of history. And uh, a rune like Tell Megiddo or the citadel, the citadel, thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. The citadel of uh, Aleppo, which is in northern Syria, over 3,000 years or about 3,000 years before Christ, uh, there was a, 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 a civilization there. And then destroyed, and then another civilization, the Neo-Hittites built there, the Assyrians built there, the, the Babylonians and even the Persian Empire built there. So imagine the platform, again, is a tell. And you're building your life, but under you is layers and layers of failed and abandoned history. I, w I was uh, listening to the radio just here, near Boston a few days ago, and they were talking about New Orleans that quite a, a, a long time ago, they took an area of New Orleans, they made it into this um, subdivision for homes and families, and then later found out that it was a, built on a toxic wasteland. And they said, you could go out into your backyard and you might have a beautiful house, but if you dug a little bit, right, just underground there is some things. And, and so there's a high ratio of cancer and, and different diseases because they're built on toxic waste. So think of a tell as really all of our lives, right? Because it's hypothetical. You know, you may not physically be living on a tell, but emotionally, we're all living on a tell, right? Because we're all affected by Adam's sin. We're all affected by humanity, family, right? Good traits, but a lot of times a lot of failure and a lot of messes, amen? Someone said that a child's personality is formed by the time the child is four years old. And I thought, okay, we've been married for 31 years and uh, she's still trying to change me, and I'm trying to change her. <laughs> Not really. Well, kind of. <laughs> but it's doubtful we'll change a lot of our basic personality. No, remember, in the Holy Ghost, we can. But, but personality is formed so young. And sometimes it's tra trauma and traumatic events and circumstances and things that shouldn't have happened. Uh, I'll give you another illustration of how we're affected negatively. So we know 
how many moms in the house? We got a mom right there, just naturally caring for her daughter. Is your mom awesome? Is your mom awesome? Yeah. So how many other moms again? Look at all the moms in the house. Wow, we're surrounded. <laughs> so we better be careful. I'm a mama's boy, and I'm 53, and, but my mom still calls me the baby because I'm the youngest of seven kids. So I'm a mama's boy, but mama we know is important because she, she carries the baby in her belly for nine months, right? Now, it, her belly looks something like mine, <laughs> right? But hers has a purpose. Mine is just really, really good food. But, but she carries the baby in her belly for nine months, and then the baby can even be fed by her body. And then usually it's the mom that wakes up first in the night of the baby cries, right? And then the baby's ready to say the first word. It's almost always da, 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 right? And I'm a guy, but even I know it's not fair. Right? It's not fair. Really, it's not fair. But why is it that this guy that doesn't bear the baby, that doesn't feed the baby, don't, you know, holds the baby, you know, you know, and mama has to tell him what to do, that this awkward guy, why is it that the baby will usually say dad that first? Why is it that, or what is it that the dad has in a child's life. Well, the secular world, not even the church, the secular world said, yes, the dad has a lot of value. And they said, are you ready for this? 80% of the, of the self-worth of a child, of a person, comes from the father. 80%. So, so imagine that. You know, and so what percentage of people in our generation do you think had a dad that said, I love you, you're wonderful, I, you're my son, you're my, you're my daughter, you're so beautiful, that just constantly affirming and helping the child and loving the child. What percentage of people in our generation have that, even if there's a functioning family, there's still really very, very few men because they are been raised on a tell themselves. They've been raised with history and hurt, and men didn't say, I love you. And so then they don't know how to say, I love you. And so they struggle. And so I come up with my own statistic. Are you ready? But I think it's pretty accurate that at least 80% of society is 80% in deficit with their self-worth. And uh, that's actually a low figure because I have tested this. In the, in, in the Netherlands, we have a lot of young people that have got saved in the last two years, and they've been transformed, and they come out of from drug culture or just agnosticism and just came out of this world, and that God has transformed their lives. And so we had a youth getaway it was us, Carl and I, and a, like 30-something young people. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And uh, we asked them to be vulnerable, and they began to talk about abuse. And, and, and you know, we won't get into all the types of abuse and the, the trauma that people go through and the horrible things. And, and, and we were just so broken because in our generation, it's almost unheard of for, for people to have what they need. Then if you add to all of those tells, those circumstances under our feet, think about bullying and think about racism. There was a, in Canada, um, there was a, 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 a Jamaican family in our church, and I remember Janelle was about 13 years old, and is this okay? I think it's okay, but uh, she was about 13 years of age, and uh, someone at school 
was, was beating her and screaming, I hate, and using the bad word, the N-word. I, I was so angry. I was so hurt. That was like 15 years ago. It didn't happen to me. It happened to her. But when I see her, I'm still devastated. You know, because I'm sure that when she goes into a room, she's wondering, you know what I mean? Is Am I safe here? You know, when I was a kid, now, there's one good thing about getting fat is uh, when, you, when you get fat, your face fills out. You know what I'm saying? When I was a kid, my face was like this wide. And these ears, I was born with ears this big. And they stuck straight out, right? And so I had this little, I was a skinny boy with ears that stuck straight out. And so on the bus, all the way to school, my nickname was Dumbo and my nickname was Ears. And the guy that sat behind me uh, would ping. I know his name. I'll never forget him. He would ping my ears all the way to school and all the way back. And after school, I would crawl under my bed and cry and say, God, I hate me. Why am I made so weird? And so I thought there was something wrong with me. Plus, I had ADHD, and that was before it was diagnosed. So, so then <laughs> I, I thought there's something wrong. So when I was a kid, I was a skinny little boy with big ears that my anxiety caused me to have little ticks, you know? <clears throat> you know? And so here I am <laughs> when I'm young. I, I remember it was years later as a pastor... I was a young pastor in my 20s, amen, that the Lord began to help me work through all of my tells. <laughs> because what happens, you're, you're like walking here on the tell, and you're wondering why, why am I feeling this way? It's because, because you're walking on history. Amen. You're walking on things. You've been affected by life. Amen. And I'm here to tell you, we live in a fallen world. But when I read the scriptures that we read tonight and know that the Bible said that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall endure forever. When I read the Bible that said, if any be in Christ, he is a new creature and all things are passed away and all things become brand new. It lets me know that we have a right as God's holy people to say, I'm not living this way. The past will not determine my future. My, my history will not stop me in the kingdom of God. I won't allow my fears to dominate me. Now, there are spirits in our world called, the Bible calls some spirits, lying spirits. Well, they're all lying spirits if they're of the devil because he's the father of lies. And then familiar spirits. Let me ha tell you how a familiar spirit works. And I'm not spooky. I'm not saying everything's the devil, okay? You don't know me, but I just don't do that. I promise you, Pastor. But there's familiar spirits. My mom, it, she had in her life, she lived for God, loved for God, but had an incredible level of, of, of anxiety attacks and panic attacks and fears and phobias. And she was a church-going, godly, apostolic woman, but she could only sit in the back row because she was afraid of crowds. And she, one of the characteristics she would have, I have my keys right here. She would have to have her keys, the keys to the, she didn't like to drive, but she, just in case, she had to have the keys to the car on her at all times. And she had to be able to say, right out the door, right there is the car. If anything happens, I can go get in the car and leave. She had this safety. So she, her, my dad is Vinny. She said, Vinny, where's the car? Where's the car? It's right there by the door. Okay, okay, I'm okay. Because she had anxiety. And her anxiety said, I need to have the keys and the car and have an escape if my panic starts to erupt. Yeah. If you've ever had that, and I have, 
it's it's real. And uh, but I remember I was I don't know I think I was in my early forties preaching at the church where my parents go to church and where I was raised. And Carl and I had been doing ministry for many years. I'm coming back home to preach and to visit my family. When I stopped our car outside of the building and started to get out, I started going, where's my keys, Carl? And I started to sweat. Where's my keys? I got to have my keys. I got to know. Uh, can we park closer to the door? I, what if something happens? And I realized, oh, my goodness, I, I'm not like this. That, that's not my problem. I've never been like this. But what happened is, is the, the, the weaknesses and the tell that my mom battled, amen, was trying to hop onto me. Does this make sense? And I said, no, in the name of Jesus Christ. In the, in the flesh, in the natural, she's my mom, and he's my dad. But in the spiritual, amen, my father which art in heaven, and we are strangers and pilgrims in this world. We're from another place. And so what you have to do, see, you're, when you receive the Holy Ghost, that's Christ in you, in your spirit, okay, when you're baptized, you're baptized into him. When you receive the Holy Ghost, it's Christ in you. So you're in him, he's in you. That's cool. And, but that's spiritual, not mental. So God saves your spirit. You have to save your brain. <laughs> that's right. And this is how you save your brain, casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalted itself above the knowledge of God. Taking every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It's like God, you have to know and believe and have faith in the finished work of Calvary. You have to know on the mercy seat in heaven that Jesus put his blood there for me. I'm covered. Satan has no right. Amen. You've got to know that so that you can fight, amen, the, 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 the lying devil, the familiar spirits. I have, I have been in church services, and God is moving. And meanwhile, the enemy literally putting pictures in people's heads. Imaginations is literally mental images. It's like a, a video screen of the worst day in your life or that awful thing that happened to you that should never have shameful things, right? Shameful things and so hurtful things. And, and I've seen people, they're in the altar lifting their hands and worshiping God. And then all of a sudden, the devil begins to try to throw those mental images to them. Amen. We're in a war. Amen. And the war is this. Amen. We've got to recognize and have faith that truly I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. And all things have passed away and all things have become new. Amen. But I myself have to choose mentally to move off my tell and off that old place and live in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. I hope this makes sense. So during the Second World War, I'm a Canadian, as I said. So, uh, during the Second World War, um, the, the Allies divided different countries in Europe up, and different Allies took different countries, and so, from the, from the Nazis. So, Canada actually was the people that liberated the Netherlands, with the help of America, of course, and with the help of Britain, but uh, they were the main ones that liberated the Netherlands, which was kind of cool, because I'm a Canadian missionary to the Netherlands. But during the Second World War, uh, Nazi Germany occupied the Netherlands. And so they brought their queen and the royal family from the Netherlands to Canada, to Ottawa, to our capital city. So they lived during the war in Canada. But there's a problem with that because the, the, the uh, Juliana, uh, the, the, the queen, was about to have a baby. 
Right? Now, there's a law. You can't be a prince or princess of the kingdom of the Netherlands, right, unless you're born in the Netherlands. Right? So if you're born outside, you're an immigrant. You can't be a prince of the Netherlands or, or a princess if you're born outside of the country. So they said, what are we going to do? She's going to have a baby in Canada. We can't get her back to, to the Netherlands. So what Canada did is they said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to take the rooms in the hospital where she delivers the baby, and we're going to give that property to the kingdom of the Netherlands. <laughs> is that cool? So in Ottawa Civic Hospital, there's two or three rooms right there, and the, and the governor general of, of Canada declared and signed it and gave it over to the kingdom of the Netherlands. <laughs> so so Ma Magritte was born in Canada <laughs> in the Netherlands. And what's cool about that is now she is eighth in line to be the queen of the Netherlands. So if, if seven people ahead of her suddenly dies, she could eventually actually be the queen of the Netherlands. Because she was born in the Netherlands in Canada. And I thought, what, what an incredible illustration. Because we are born again in the kingdom of God. Right, so you might have been born in, in in New Hampshire. You might have been born in Massachusetts, but you were born again in the kingdom of God. Amen. You're not strangers and foreigners, but you're fellow citizens with the household of God. Amen. So you're not an immigrant to heaven. You belong in heaven. <laughs> Amen. You're not a stranger to us. You belong to us, to the kingdom of God. Amen. And so you're freeborn. <laughs> you're freeborn. So, so you, don't, you don't live on a tell. You, maybe your daddy did. Maybe your mama did. Maybe when you were young and you went through some stuff. Amen. But that's not who you are. And I think uh, of 80% of your self-worth, that's a lot. But then I think of how many times in the Holy Bible... Did the Bible say he's the father to the fatherless? <laughs> and when he gives his spirit to us, he, the spirit itself, remember the New Testament was written in Greek, and the Greek words, Abba, Father, are endearing childlike words like daddy, daddy. And he said when the Holy Ghost comes in you, it cries back to him, daddy, daddy. <laughs> daddy, daddy. Amen. Maybe you never heard I love you, but you do now. <laughs> Amen. Maybe you never heard, Amen, you're sweet and beautiful and wonderful, but you do now. <laughs> because we have a heavenly father, Amen, that doesn't live on a tell. He lives in the kingdom. Amen. And so do you. You are not what the devil lies to you about. You are not what the devil tells you you are. You're a child of the Most High God. Amen. You're special. There's an anointing on your life. Amen. And that is the end of it. We're going to live together with him in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we stand together? And uh, if you're here today and you have been struggling, if you have been struggling with anxiety, if you've been struggling with panic, uh, insomnia, sleepless, sleeplessness, Worry, depression, all of those mental things the devil, condemnation would like to kill us and destroy us with. Amen. Could you, would you mind just being honest before all of us and lift your hand? Thank you. Just keep your hand up. Look around, all of us. You know why? Because we live in this world and we have an enemy. So I'm going to pray for you that a spirit of deliverance from the Holy Ghost would fall on us tonight. And God would set you free to know who you are. Amen. I want us to come down to the front before we pray. Is that all right, Pastor? Come on down to the front. I think we're still good for time. Oh, my goodness, it's only quarter to eight. But I want us to pray together in Jesus' name. And I'm going to pray. We're going to pray as sons and daughters.